So welcome again to this webinar on supporting refugee students' education and well-being in Uganda. Uh, for those of you who are joining us today, uh, 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 thank you so much for joining the, the session. As I mentioned, this is a pre-recorded webinar presentation, but we will also have a live Q&A session um, uh, along with the speaker who will, uh, is, more th is more than happy to engage with you after the the session after the presentation. Um, to give you a brief introduction of the speaker, uh, presenting this topic today is Zahara Namanda, uh, who is the executive director of Utopia Foundation. Zahara is one of the founders of the Africa, Africa Education and Leadership Initiative in Uganda, which is a, an NGO empowering refugees and local youth, especially females, through education, leadership, and well-being. She will be talking extensively about her work in this presentation. Her experience includes working as an advocate and implements uh, uh, and an implementer for equitable and inclusive education programming in undeserved communities. Um, Zahara was also awarded a Mandela Washington Fellowship and the International Women's Sustainability Award, amongst others. Um, I'm pleased to let you know that Zahara Namanda is a 2020 Shared Scholar from Uganda and she completed her MSc in Education, Public Policy and Equity at the University of Glasgow. I will now start her recording. Um, and please, if you have any questions, please make notes of your question and send them through the chat box. We will also have a Q&A ses session later. Enjoy the recording. Hi hey everyone, welcome to my webinar. Apologies that last time it was very difficult for me to continue, but here we are um, supporting refugee students' education and well-being in Uganda. Uh, this is the theme of the webinar today, and my name is Zahara Namanda, who is uh, presenting at this webinar. Yeah, so uh, we are going to have an overview. Uh, we shall have an introduction, um, Africa Education and Leadership Initiative, the organization where I work, and then have a context of refugee education in Uganda, inclusive diversity education model, um, a model that I, I, I created from scratch during my um, master's um, degree, uh, the wellbeing program, challenges and solutions, and then we shall be in position to go to the Q&A um, session and then conclude. Yeah, so about me, uh, of course I said, uh, my name is Zahara Namanda, and I am a 2020, um, stroke 2021 Commonwealth Scholar who graduated in a master's um, degree in education, public policy and equity at uh, the University of Glasgow in Scotland with a dis distinction um, in my degree. Yay for that. Um, yeah, currently I work as an executive director for Africa ELI, that's Africa Education and Leadership Initiative. This is an NGO that is working in Uganda um, to support refugees and local vulnerable children. Um, and as well, I work as, uh, as the director for Utopia Foundation. This is a, um, um, a charity based in Michigan and uh, we support literacy for children in Africa. I'm an educator for those who uh, may be wondering why I do the work that I do. Um, I love research, so I, I use evidence-based data to support education um, systems and um, leadership. Um, in 2021, I was awarded uh, the Women's Sustainability um, Award um, because of my work uh, towards contributing um, to refugee education. And I am a 2019 Mandela Washington Scholar. Yeah, Africa ELI's profile, again, Africa ELI's Africa Education and Leadership Initiative. Uh, we promote access to education, well-being resources, and leadership development opportunities for East African youth, especially girls. Um, by 2027, we aspire to educate 3,500 students, 70% uh, being females, 
and uh, train 2,000 teachers in the well-being, pedagogy, leadership, and practical instructional skills, and en enhance uh, leadership in 50 schools through our education mission. What we've done, uh, we've provided education scholarships to over 3,000 students, uh, trained 500 teachers, offered well-being training to 100 students and teachers, life skills training to 6,000 youth, and of course, looking at literacy for children. Um, and we have done this uh, by reaching out to 1,000 schools. Yeah, uh, we are celebrating over 10 years of delivering global goals. Um, and uh, basically we've been reaching out, um, focusing on SDG3, that is promoting good health and well-being uh, for everyone, especially children and youth, but we focus on SDG4 quality education. We use education as a tool of transformation to support education for youth and uh, children who especially are going through um, a crisis such as the refugees. We've been promoting gender equality, basically looking at uh, promoting um, girls' education and uh, women participation through our work. And um, just like I mentioned in the previous slide, that our impact has been enormous uh, by supporting 3,000, uh, over 3,000 um, scholars. Um, of course, uh, majority being women is a very big achievement for us. Yeah, looking at the refugee situation in Uganda, Uganda has been in a refugee crisis. I mean, um, the refugee crisis is happening currently everywhere. But in East Africa, we see that Uganda is taking on the lead in hosting over 1.4 million refugees, and majority of these refugees are from South Sudan. Um, half of the refugee population, um, children in need of education and other well-being needs, and uh, female ch child refugees are particularly affected due to household dynamics and culture beliefs that fail to prioritize their education. Of course, um, the refugee crisis has been um, brought by um, the wars um, and political instabilities that are happening in different countries, neighboring countries to Uganda, such as um, South Sudan, we see Democratic Republic of Congo, and Uganda being a hub of um, refugees and also uh, being the center um, in the center of East Africa. We see that um, it's been very hospitable to uh, refugees and um, honestly this has been a very great contribution that Uganda is offering to the refugees and also in support um, to peace building um, so societies uh, by allowing in and making policies that are uh, really critical in um, including refugees in its um, planning and communities. Yeah, we see there are lots of gaps amidst Uganda being really a very good host for refugees. We see that there are lots of challenges that um, are um, existing in support to refugee education in Uganda. A majority of the refugees that uh, are flying to Uganda really have gone through different and difficult um, situations which lead to trauma. So uh, most of the refugee students become um, uh, very, very aggressive, which some of the teachers do not really understand. You know, they recall different um, difficult um, challenges that they went through, the loss of their families and uh, relatives. So this all contribute to post-traumatic stress disorder, which these refugee students really exhibit while in school. And we see that schools rarely prioritize trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care is uh, recognizing the needs of um, the well-being needs, emotional well-being needs uh, for, for refugees. And um, Ugandan schools or Ugandan teachers have not been trained to really uh, diagnose such kind of uh, challenges. Uh, but majority of the refugee students and children that go through uh, the Ugandan curriculum really find a lot of difficulties in addition to um, their personal experiences as refugees, which really create a crisis in schools. And teachers have uh, low skills in terms of uh, supporting refugee students um, and of course um, their skills in um, 
professionalism, uh, we see that they are not adequately equipped to support refugee students and also to teach um, in a culturally uh, relevant pedagogy that can uh, profit refugee children. Uh, education access for refugees um, is really very limited amidst of um, you know, accessing poor quality education. We see that majority of teachers um, not highly skilled and also um, um, the different resources needed to support refugee education are really not available or are in low quantity. There is limited diversity in curriculum content and instructional pedagogy. Um, limited diversity in curriculum means that um, the refugee um, needs, education needs are rarely recognized in our curriculum as our curriculum is so much um, uh, based on um, the Ugandan situation and the larger um, or international context, which does not um, critically uh, point out refugee needs. And so as refugee children go through such kind of an education, they don't see similarities of their communities back in their countries and also their experiences into the curriculum, which is very, very uh, difficult. Low accountability and continuous agency among stakeholders. Um, the refugee crisis in Uganda has been very complex. And we see that, of course, Uganda having a very big number of refugees. This has been um, an issue in terms of resources, uh, re resource redistribution, of course, as we have more refugees coming, coming in, we see that the nationals also lose a bit of uh, their resources to the refugee crisis. Uh, to the refugees. And um, as we can see, Uganda is not the wealthiest um, economy. Actually, it's one of the struggling economies and having a big number of refugees is a very big crisis for it. And so people do not have shared accountability and agency for uh, refugee education because um, resources are strained and also uh, nationals feel that uh, they need more other than focusing those resources to um, the refugees um, who are coming into uh, big numbers. Yeah, so uh, promoting inclusive refugee education in Uganda, this is a model that I created during my uh, thesis, um, yeah, at the University of Glasgow. And uh, basically, as I created this, I so much pointed out the crisis that I have uh, shared in the previous uh, slides, we see that policies are made, uh, but then are they inclusive? So I came up with Bear with me a moment, I'll just access the video recording. to support the refugee crisis in Africa, uh, particularly in Uganda, but this model can be repl replicated to be used anywhere in the world. Um, as you can see, this model has equity as the center. I mean, e equitable uh, distribution of resources, equity in decision-making, equity in uh, promoting refugee education. And then as uh, we have equity in the center, we see that um, 
there should be smart policies designed, um, there should be instructional leadership and professional development for teachers, uh, well-being and mindfulness for refugee children, accountability for all, and then uh, this all brings in the political representation, the resource redistribution, and the cultural recognition for the participants, especially refugees. And at the end of it all, once this is incorporated into the system, we see that we will have an improved inter integrated policies and participation, an inclusive curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, diversity in teacher skills and uh, class management, language and cultural diversity in school, improved well-being, shared accountability and responsibility. Yeah, the inclusive diversity model, as illustrated in, in the previous um, a slide, uh, promotes integrated uh, policy participation and also promotes inclusive learning and tailored pedagogical instruction, which is a challenge as of now in the Ugandan schools. And then it en enhances teacher skills and diversity in curriculum instruct instructions. Most of the, teach the, the teachers do not um, understand uh, refugee needs in education so this um idem factors in that and then it promotes quality in education delivery because teachers are um, trained and then there is equity in decision making and then participants um ideas are integrated into the curriculum and then improves teacher and student well-being because it particularly factors out well-being and mindfulness as an important aspect in building integrated learning for refugee children. And then at the end of it all, we see that everyone is accountable and then there is agency among stakeholders in terms of supporting refugee education and in terms of recognizing the needs of refugees in Uganda and across the world. Yeah, focusing on the well-being for refugees, we've um, um, Africa ELI uh, has been using uh, the 4W Women and Wellbeing in Wisconsin and in the World Initiative at uh, the University of Wisconsin Madison. This is a lift model uh, which we've been using, and basically it focuses on self. So as we see that most of the times refugees come and they are going through a post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, that means they have lost a lot of their love, they have lost a lot of their belonging, and um, as they get into the new society, they really need to fill the gap within themselves. So this, mod, uh, this model focuses on self and then looks at the place, culture, time, and then identity. But then you see it has um, the different components, as you see, um, lifelong health, interconnection, freedom and safety, and then thriving. So the different photos within, uh, that's engagement, belonging, mutual care, purpose, voice and expression, growth and flourishing. All of this is very important uh, for the refugees to really uh, be in a society where they're recognized, they feel happy, uh, loved, and then belong. But this can only happen if um, they get to feel um, the missing needle within themselves. So this 4W uh, lift model uh, supports um, refugees to grow their belonging, their relationship, um, to be a part of the community, um, to learn how um, they can keep safe, how to access basic care needs, and then um, get to also uh, do community projects such as care for the earth and all of that. And uh, well, so I want to recognize my team that has been very critical in terms of supporting refugee well-being um, in Uganda. And uh, this is an, um, an integrated team from the University of California um, and then Africa Education and Leadership Initiative in Uganda. Um, so we could see uh, Dr. Amy Bentleaf, a professor at UC San Diego, I met Professor Bentleaf um, in a conference at the University of California in Berkeley, and she was presenting about well-being. And uh, by coincidence, I was presenting about um, well-being needs for refugee students that I worked with. I didn't have an expertise in terms of um, recognizing uh, refugee um, um, needs in terms of emotional well-being, but Dr. Amy really had the expertise and uh, 
both our knowledge um, got um, very um, integrated and so we came up uh, with a program in Uganda. Of course, Dr. Amy was very, very important in terms of, um, you know, uh, promoting this um, well-being uh, program in Uganda. And then um, we have um, Dr. Penina Beinomukisha. She's our chairman, uh, board of directors, and she's um, a professor at Victoria University and a researcher. Rebecca Levine, a PhD student at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, she's been really, really very critical in terms of supporting the well-being clubs and the well-being content that we use or tools that we use to support refugee students. Wendy, um, she's a PhD student at UC San Diego, and Wendy is very uh, phenomenal in terms of supporting um, girls and, um, you know, supporting them in, in, in uh, income generating activities as a way of promoting their well-being. And then Naltaya Nora, who is a teacher and also a board member for Africa ELI, and of course a, a trainer for the well-being program. Our team is very, um, very committed and um, very, very supporting of the well-being needs of refugee uh, students in Uganda and ac across the globe. Yeah, so our well-being club curriculum, um, so um, the team that you saw have been very instrumental in terms of um, contextualizing the well-being curriculum that Dr. Amy Bintliff uh, created um, to support um, children's well-being across the world. Uh, but basically, the curriculum has been contextualized um, to the needs of refugees in Uganda. And um, it is composed of 11 modules, um, highly contextualized um, to the needs um, at best student-centered hands-on activities involves mindfulness focuses on student voice and activism we could see um, that um, the well-being program really uses um, you know dialogues we call them talking circles and in terms of these um, students are in position to have pep talks with themselves but also have dialogues by um, their uh, peers or teammates and this has been very very critical in terms of supporting their understanding of well-being and also participation in the well-being this picture shows a portrait a self-portrait for one of the students who um, you know designed a personal portrait to promote well-being um, to show how she felt about herself and as you can see, uh, this picture really explains a lot um, that we can understand or we may not understand. So um, students are in position to recognize themselves in different ways and um, students are in position to know who they are, rediscover themselves. Um, in the 11 modules, we have um, in introductions in each module, and then components of the well-being. So you would see in the well-being um, model that I shared that has health in the center. Those are all different um, uh, modules, I mean uh, components of the well-being model. And then spheres of influence. And sphere, the spheres of influence we have, uh, for example, the community, the state, the family, and all of that. So identifying feelings, students are in position to identify their feelings, to know when they feel sad, when they feel happy, and uh, what they have to say, or um, what are their needs to feel um, the different weak points. Um, Self-image, most of the times as refugee students get into schools, they feel different from the other students. And um, basically, they are seen in a different ways by the community, but also that uh, creates a very negative picture for themselves about who they are. So we reinvent um, the wheel of them understanding who they are and then appreciating themselves and then getting to know that they are worthy, they are um, strong, they are intelligent and they can be anywhere in the world to be uh, themselves. So we promote self-care because of the trauma that students come with in schools. So promoting self-care, students have created their own ways of promoting self-care, for example, dancing, singing. Uh, but basically our 
our curriculum so much centers on the mindfulness so students are in position to do different uh, basic uh, mindfulness activities such as breathing in and, and out uh, which really makes them relax and makes them feel at home to share um, or dialogue with teams and also their mentors and uh, facilitators. The self-portrait, just like the previous one that I shared when a girl was holding a self-portrait, and self-portraits is how students see themselves, how they feel, um, how they think, um, who are they, all of that really gets um, integrated into the self-portraits and um, it helps them to re-understand themselves and then how um, they feel and um, their purpose in life. And then we use the art lab. So we do different art bas basic art activities such as, uh, you know, um, drawing the, the portraits and then painting. We have um, uh, different um, galleries that the students create and all of that uh, creates a very great communication for students uh, who have gone through trauma and cannot communicate basically by the word of mouth so they would communicate through art exploring community um, every um, student gets to know that after you know they get to understand who are they um, their self-care uh, the spheres of influence of well-being, identifying feelings and all of that, then they are in position to understand uh, their community and how this community is relevant um, to building their leadership, their participation, and uh, them promoting um, the, um, the needs or identifying the needs of their community. And then we have uh, community well-being students would look at what are the challenges that uh, their communities face, for example, challenges with, uh, with well-being, um, challenges with health and challenges with maybe economic empowerment. And after they recognize that, uh, they are in position to come up with activism project. An activism project is a project that students identify as a team or individuals um, to support community growth and empowerment. Uh, for, and the end, at the end of the um, curriculum, we shall have a celebration. Every student will be in position to um, um, you know, celebrate with others and uh, celebrate the wins. And then we give out um, certificates and then we, we launch the wellbeing clubs for sustainability. The content, contents of each uh, module uh, always will have welcoming games, mindfulness scripts, discussion scripts and prompts, artistic learning, and then a closing activities. Uh, here you see a collage um, that students uh, made using um, art resources. And then this really showed how they feel love for themselves. Um, this is all after they go through um, the curriculum and then they get to understand that they are great and wonderful. Um, the impact of uh, well-being training and research um, has really increased students' voice and self-confidence. We see students come and they never want to talk. They are um, scared, uh, they feel the new environment um, may harm them just because of what they went through as um, refugees and all the circumstances that they are going through because they really have lots of challenges uh, stemming from home and then to school. Uh, but the well-being program has been really, really very supportive to increase the students' voice and self-confidence. And this has been through um, talking circles. Students are in position to have a talking speak, um, talking speak or a talking piece. A talking piece is any, um, anything that a students can use. And once anybody has a talking piece, they will be in position to share something. So students feel accountable to their peers. Um, they feel that um, you know, their voices are relevant and this has grown their confidence to speak out to their challenges and um, needs uh, that they really um, need to support their well-being and education. It has created space for peer friendship and peer learning. Uh, students have been in position to learn from each other because um, initially, um, for example, we focus so much on the South Sudanese um, refugees. Um, 
there are different tribes and students um, initially are grouped group themselves into tribes but uh, you know the well-being uh, program or the well-being training is really so keen on um, working together and having the well-being tribe as the language other than the tribe the tribal um, disintegration that students are trying to create at the beginning so these are all dismantled in the way that um, students focus on their well-being and uh, looking at the well-being tribe everyone is to support the well-being of the other but not to harm their well-being and so this has enhanced friendships among peers and peer learning um, improved self-efficacy and leadership especially for teachers teachers have been in position to learn um, how to support students and also how to recognize their needs, which is really very key uh, for um, students to participate and also trust their teachers in terms of um, the needs and challenges that they go through. It has increased uh, student engagement at school. Of course, when somebody's voice um, is loud and if somebody's self-confidence is promoted, then they are in position to engage with confidence in different activities. We've seen that our uh, well-being uh, students are um, head boys in schools, they are head girls in schools, they are prefects, I should say, and this has promoted their leadership skills within their schools facilitated new friendships. Within the well-being clubs, uh, students uh, take on leadership and they initiate uh, friends into the well-being club and other students. And this has facilitated new friendship and of course going through the curriculum and training. Everyone is different and uh, students from different classes are brought together and through that they're in position to bond and create new friendships um, during the trainings and after the trainings. Um, it has strengthened uh, relationships with friends and family. The well-being program or training focuses so much on um, um, the strength of the different uh, dimensions of well-being and uh, the spheres of influence. We see that friends and family are very important um, in influencing well-being for, for students. And so um, this has created a space for them to think through um, their friends and, and families are promoting love and belonging and um, sharing uh, challenges and difficulties um, in their education, in their personal uh, life with friends and family, which has really strengthened their relationships. And then mindfulness reduced stress and promoted leadership. Many of the students who go through the mindfulness activities, such as breathing, they really um, feel less intense with uh, difficulties. One of our students said that um, when she's called, up, called upon in the staff room uh, for teachers, um, she breathes in, in and out uh, to let go of her fears and tension as she walks into the staff room. So this has really promoted um, um, well-being for students at school and also um, the students have been in position to uh, be leaders in terms of uh, critical awareness and also uh, support for other students. Um, youth began teaching parents and siblings um, about the strategies. Of course, anything that works within a community, um, uh, people would be in position to um, extend it to other people, such as their beloved ones. And so uh, students have been in position to train their siblings and then parents um, about the well-being program and the well-being content and then mindfulness, um, which has promoted love and belonging for students. And parents have reported that the students who have been in position to uh, be a part of the well-being program have really changed at home and are supporting families in different ways, which we are very happy to hear. Yeah, so well-being community activism um, impact. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that um, after the, the, the different um, trainings for the students, then students start to um, merge into the, the, the bigger community. And so every student gets to um, um, identify a team and then the team will work on a community project um, to promote community activism and impact. And as you can see, uh, recently our students went to Arua City Radio and then they promoted um, 
the relevance of promoting uh, girl child education and um, you know just communities. So um, they spoke about why um, education for girls is important, and uh, they mentioned a very very critical um, thing about girls being um, present within their families in terms of growth and if they go into school then uh, families and communities really have a, a very big um, impact and then empowerment uh, due to the leadership of, of girls and women. And then we see good hygiene leads to greater health. This was another um, um, community project that students carried out in Kamocha Market in Uganda um, in the metropolitan city. Um, and we see that um, the, during COVID-19, there were lots of worries regarding health and regarding hygiene. And so the students, uh, through the permission of police, they were in position to clean up the market to promote good hygiene. And then a very important um, project on conserving um, the environment, caring for the earth. So some of the students were in position to uh, plant trees and um, their aim was to promote um, conservation uh, for the environment, which is very, very critical. Yeah, student, um, of course, as we have gone through that, uh, that is the well-being program for Africa Education and Leadership Initiative. We've been in position to work with different partners, such as African Women and Girls Organization for Total Knowledge to promote the well-being program. And of course, mainly with the University of California, San Diego, uh, the Department of Education through the lead of Dr. Amy Bintley. And um, here are some of the recom recommendations, of course, uh, for student well-being and uh, basically for whoever is working on um, well-being uh, for students, especially for refugee students, it's very important to use evidence-based uh, data, uh, such as, of course, carrying out a baseline um, for well-being data for learners. This helps you to know, um, you know, what are the needs for, for students and uh, the different strategies you may employ to support uh, refugee students' well-being. Uh, Trauma-informed care trainings. Once you know exactly what the students are going through, then you are in position to employ strategies that focus on the trauma and then trainings that students can undertake to support their well-being needs. And then employing learner-centered pedagogies. Of course, in schools, this is very important. And as we know, um, in Africa, for example, Uganda, we so much still focus on um, the traditional way um, of uh, pedagogy, which is a little bit phasing out, but this is still a very big limita limitation uh, for students who are experiencing challenges such as refugees. So it is very important to employ learner-centered pedagogies because through such a pedagogy, you are in position to know the challenges of students and also students are in position to work with you as peers to support uh, their learning. Promoting self-care for the most vulnerable students, for example, girls. Of course, people may ask, why is it girls? Girls go through different challenges, uh, for example, sexual exploitation. And as you can see, research um, identify that majority of the girls who go through such kind of um, exploitation uh, may stay silent. So they may not speak about that and um, they are going through challenges of um, uh, recognition, challenges of um, uh, you know, sexual exploitation, uh, which is very key for, for teachers to really uh, promote self-care and get to understand such kind, kind of challenges that girls go through or other uh, victims like boys. Um, yeah, so promoting self-care, um, a school needs to uh, really have a very good self-care um, spa or a very good uh, self-care center for the students to support themselves, but also peers to support students and teachers supporting students. Um, create well-being clubs. Well-being clubs have been very, very, very important in, in support for children's learning, children's recognition, belonging, love, um, as I mentioned, of course, uh, through the well-being clubs that Africa ELI is promoting in schools where they work with, uh, which we work with. 
and then introducing peer talking circles. A peer talking circles are very important because <clears throat> the problem, problems in schools most of the time stem from learners, peers who do not understand, for example, uh, local peers who may not understand why refugees are people like them, why refugees should be recognized in school. So other than peers naming, for example, refugees, any other name um, other than their names, uh, it, is, it is important for them to um, have the peer talking circles to understand um, the relevance of um, supporting their peers who are going through challenges such as refugees and then promoting community activism and stewardship. Refugee education is very important. For example, in Uganda, we see that um, as much as we are supporting refugee education, are we supporting enough community activism for the refugee students to participate? Um, my answer may be no. Um, so we should be in position to promote community activism, especially for refugee students to feel the belonging, to feel a part of the community and to also know that the knowledge that they're learning, they are in position to bring it back to promote community well-being and community empowerment. Um, yeah, and also take the same knowledge back to their home places to promote peace, um, peaceful communities back to their homes. Africa ELI, uh, in the course of promoting um, inclusive education, We've had different challenges that we've gone through, for example, cult cultural barriers and beliefs, of course, working with refugee students. These are students who are coming from uh, different communities, for example, South Sudan. Um, they have different um, you know, cultural beliefs and all of that. So working with families or their families, um, there are lots of barriers, for example, regarding um, girl child marriage. These are barriers that are very difficult sometimes to um, to liaise with in terms of you know getting uh, parents to understand why it is important girls to be educated um, in, in schools other than them being married off. Um, financial constraints to implement programs. We have the capacity to implement these programs but um, sometimes we are constrained with uh, resources in terms of finance to continue doing our work uh, but irrespective of that, we've been very, very critical in terms of pushing through to promote inclusive education because waiting uh, for finances uh, may be a very long term process. So we use um, the little resources we have to promote this. How to reach communities. We really work with how to reach communities and sometimes uh, going to the camps has been a struggle. So most of the times due to the resources we concentrate on um, refugee schools, populated schools to support uh, refugee needs and well-being, tight school schedules, of course, to promote um, such programs, for example, um, the well-being program, there needs to be collaboration with schools and getting to understand the school schedules so that um, the program would be implemented, but also school schedules continue um, to be delivered in the way they are supposed to be delivered. And then negative attitudes among stakeholders, of course, in some communities, um, of, people may have a negative attitude, such as uh, you know, facing away the cultural um, norms and all of that. But then once they get to understand the needs, then they are in position to come work together. What we've done to solve such challenges, of course, we've used evidence-based data to design programs, and these programs have been in position to let us understand uh, the best practices that we can do to support the needs of refugees and the communities where they come from. Engaging schools and parents in uh, program planning and implementation. Uh, by these, parents feel accountable and parents feel a part of the program, um, which at the end of it all they support. Sensitizing and training communities uh, so that they get to understand the need of cultural education, the need of uh, transforming negative um, beliefs uh, that may impede girls to access education, and then ha having international community partnerships to promote um, our work and also as a way to um, create agency in terms of um, um, getting uh, finances to support the work that we do. These are some of the references that I had for you. 
And then we will be going into the question and answer session. Of course, um, as we get into um, this whole well-being talk, uh, one thing that I've identified is that uh, there is a very important quote that I identify with, and this is my conclusion that when we see beauty in human tragedy, we become active agents of change that are responsible and committed to make the world better. There is no way we can make the world better without recognizing perfection in imperfection. As we see, the refugee crisis has lots of imperfections, but as we recognize the needs um, of the students, of the children who are vulnerable, then we get to know that uh, we have a call for uh, the work that we do. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, Zahara. I would now request you to please unmute yourself for the Q&A session. Okay, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming again. Perfect. Um, uh, well, I hope you all enjoyed the uh, webinar presentation. Uh, I would like to start the Q&A session now. Um, we will have to end the webinar in about 15 minutes or so. Uh, so I will like to start with questions that we have received in the registration form. So Zahara, if you're ready, uh, I would uh, start with a Q&A session. Uh, but in the meantime, I would like to request the attendees to please send in any questions you might have about the webinar topic, or if you'd like to uh, raise any questions for Zahara, please do so using the chat box. Um, and we will try our best to, uh, I'll try my best to raise these questions. Um, all right, Zahara, so the first question is, um, how is the government coming in to support early childhood education for the refugees in Uganda? Um. Thank you so much, um, Eva. So uh, looking at the refugee um, crisis in Uganda, of course we see that um, government is very fundamental actually, just like I mentioned in, in my model that uh, policies are very instrumental in driving the changes that we need for refugee participation. And of course, participation in terms of education, in terms of well-being. And so having policies in Uganda that, first of all, are hospitable is one credit for, for the government because most of the, um, the policies in other countries are really very, very um, intense for refugees. And um, as we go step by step, um, what we haven't recognized is that these policies have always not been inclusive, but um, we are realizing there is a big shock in terms of that. And um, government is partnering with different CSOs. Um, those are you know, non-governmental organization, private organizations that are keen in uh, delivering better um, better understanding of the refugee situation. We are not yet there, but at least uh, there are dialogues that are um, taking place in terms of improving well-being, in terms of improving education um, for, for refugees. And um, I think having um, a pedagogy or having a curriculum that factors in um, well-being and uh, refugee participation will only be achieved uh, at a national level if policies allow and also if the curriculum in school can integrate um, the knowledge that the refugees really need. Um, you may agree with me, those who are uh, yeah, Ugandans um, yeah, on this chat, that um, our curriculum is not um, is aggregated in terms of like uh, taking every learner as similar. 
which is not true because if a refugee child is in school and they don't see themselves into the picture of the curriculum, then their struggles are not recognized and then that um, impedes on their participation and also uh, communication or uh, belonging and voice in the curriculum and um, in the schools where they are. Because if the curriculum is not um, inclusive, then it means that even participation is going to be the same and uh, some of the children's voices is not going to be heard. So um, yeah, I think we shall go back to my model, IDEM, um, to help the government, you know, advocate for 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 better policies and a factoring in well-being as a very important aspect. Thank you so much for your response. And I think you have also lightly touched upon one of the questions that has come through in the chat box, uh, which is uh, to what extent were the refugee students involved in the development of the curriculum? Is there any further uh, information that you can add to this? That's very, very, yeah, that's a very great question. So before we um, finalize with our curriculum, we had, um, we had a prototype of the curriculum and then we undertook um, a, a pilot study. Uh, this pilot study supported us to, uh, we piloted this with 25 students. Uh, those were very diverse, including refugees, including um, kids, ghetto kids in Uganda, including kids from middle class, and then kids from low income, um, income families. So we understood that this uh, curriculum was really very diverse and it was different, but it, participating um, in terms of calling out students to see what works for them and what doesn't work for them. There are so many things that we moved out of the curriculum because they were not contextualized in terms of what um, the students' needs were. So we were collecting data, we were learning from the students and they were teaching us so many things that currently are involved in the curriculum and things that we use um, or that are in the um, in the curriculum as modules. So um, students are were very, very involved as well as their parents, as well as the, the teachers uh, we piloted with. That's a very interesting fact, uh, Zahara. And uh, just to add to that, were there any designated schools for the refugees or are they infused in uh, or included in the regular schools in the region? Yeah, so uh, basically the schools that we work with currently, uh, you find that 99%, um, 98% of children are, are, are refugees. But somebody would also ask why um, um, you know, our host communities uh, or why don't we do that in a school that has half host communities and half maybe refugee students. Um, previously, when our um, education program, for example, uh, the scholarship program, we had a crisis whereby students did not thrive in schools that uh, they only saw themselves as the, 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 um, the minority. And so we found out that, you know, their voices were really very low. Um, their belonging was was so low, even if they were talented. So we experimented to see how do these students behave in a school where the community is um, has more of, of people who look like them. And that was totally different because they felt, you know, um, belonging, they felt the love amidst of having, of course, a few challenges of, of that they come with as, you know, this is not um, um, my tribe, tribe meant or this. So those they learned later on in time and uh, factoring into refugee uh, focused schools, um, it helps for them to have space for themselves. And once they go to interact with the bigger community, Community, then they are ready because themselves are, are willing and they feel the belonging and they feel they are ready to to mingle with 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 the bigger society. So that has been really really very fundamental for them to engage and also um, for them to feel that they are ready to participate in the bigger community. 
Amazing. Um, so the next question is, um, how many refugee settlements in Uganda uh, was part of this, this project? So um, currently we focused on uh, one refugee settlement um, that is a rhino camp. Um, it is in Arua. I know a majority of the Ugandans would, would know rhino camp. And um, yeah, so rhino camp and then other communities that are host communities or non-host communities, just like you saw, some of our participation are with um, um, students who are local because well-being does not only focus on refugee uh, refugee needs, but also uh, local vulnerable students. So our curriculum is getting uh, more diverse uh, from refugees, but also to local vulnerable students as well. This is a follow-up question to that, um, which we've received in the uh, registration form is, the boy child is, or, or you know, the, the boy students are largely left out in psychosocial and moral support as opposed to girl students. How best can you support the boy students in, in the school and the curriculum? Sounds great. Um, yeah, so... Uh, basically, the well-being program is not focused on girls. Uh, once I look into our numbers, we see that boys and girls, actually, the number um, is half or girls may be a little bit, um, five, a little bit, um, say, if we had 100 students, say, girls may be 50 and boys may be uh, 45, for example, or 60, um, 65, and then, yeah, just a, a difference of five. So um, one thing that we discovered was that challenges that girls go through are always um, brought by cultural barriers. And in the cultural barrier setting, we see that um, living in, in a patriarchal society that majorly focuses on, um, you know, uh, the dominancy of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of men, for example, and then um, girls being left out we recognize that such challenges are still existing and also the perpetrators most of the times um, in decision-making are uh, men. So if we do not train them or if we don't bring um, the two groups together, then we are not going to achieve what we really want. So in the well-being program, uh, we focus on creating well-being for all, all people, all students to ensure that everyone is mindful, is mindful about the well-being of, of, of the other. So this does not need to be a girl, this does not need to be a boy, but it needs to be um, a community. And a community does not only have a girl child, but it has a setting of both girls, both boys, um, which we've been recognizing in this uh, program. So both boys and girls work together and identify challenges and support each other and grow together. And that is what we call the well-being program. Amazing. Um, I know we have now reached the time to end the webinar, but just one last quick question that I've seen in the box and then we will end shortly. Uh, how do you evaluate the impact of your project? How do we evaluate so how impact? Are, oh, sorry. Oh, yes. okay. How do yes, we evaluate, how do you impact? evaluate the impact? We do, uh, given the fact this is a research-based um, program, so we have lots of um, data collection. We do a baseline, we, we do pre, um, and, and then we do um, uh, surveys, we do reports, we do um, uh, interviews, we do observations. We recognize, uh, I mean, we integrate lots of um, um, impact assessment tools. And um, at the end of it all, uh, this helps us to get to know our impact uh, while involving schools and also while, while invo involving leaders in, in the setting, because um, recognizing that uh, the well-being program is um, also implemented by students and also co-implemented by teachers and co-implemented by us. So um, evaluators help us 
of course, students, ourselves and teachers. So we have tools, data collection tools that we constantly review to assess our impact. And also the University of Cal California has been very, very instrumental in supporting us uh, with, um, you know, impact assessment um, in terms of um, working together as a team to uh, design better tools that are efficient to capture our impact and also continue to uh, write papers um, and articles that are informative um, to, to, to our stakeholders, but also to the bigger community. And I can say that uh, one of our paper was selected um, in this uh, recent uh, um, conference for the American Education uh, Research um, Association. So we were in position to present our data and outcome of the well-being program in Uganda. That is fantastic news, Zahara. Congratulations on that. Uh, with this, we now come to an end of the Q&A session. I am aware that we do have a few more questions in the chat box uh, and also queries on how to connect with Zahara. So Zahara is more than happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. Her name is Zahara Namanda. You can find her on LinkedIn and via her email address, which I have uh, just added in the chat box. Um, if you have any questions regarding Zahara's work with refugee students in Uganda, um, or would like to build connections with her, please feel free to get in touch with her. Um, with this, Zahara, I would like to thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, and for engaging with our attendees uh, and share more about and for sharing more about your your work with us all um, and also thank you so much to all our lovely attendees for joining us today uh, Zahara any final words before we end the webinar Oh, I wish to thank uh, you and um, everyone for joining in because I I didn't think we would have really people come participate, but um, yeah, again, after the first glitch, but thank you so much uh, for coming. And um, in case um, anyone needs support um, in terms of well-being, in terms of ideas or collaboration, I'm very, very happy to, uh, and open to that. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a, a good day, everyone.